Coming up, America's cake wars are headed to the Supreme Court. We don't have any tradition in this country of forcing people to celebrate somebody else's religious event. The baker at the center of the case speaks out. I really had no idea that it could escalate to something like this. And then, a former 700 Club co-host comes home. Best-selling author and speaker Sheila Walsh returns to our studios on today's 700 Club. What we can do right now. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. By the way, if you live in Virginia or you live in New Jersey, vote, because today is a crucial election for governor in those two states. You've got your election tie on. That's impressive. Well, I like to <laughs> dress for the season. That's good for the occasion. Whatever the season. Yeah. <laughs> if it's Christmas, I'd wear a Santa Claus on my... <laughs> All right. You know, the Air Force really screwed up with that man in Texas. They knew he was a convicted felon. They knew he was had been arrested and imprisoned because of violent abuse, and yet he did not notify the FBI. It was not in the database, and so the man was able to purchase weapons. That's how bad it was. You know, our government, God bless them, they're so big, and they don't talk to each other. They, there are several major problems that have arisen because of the fact they do not communicate the same thing was true with 9-11. One of the officers of the FBI knew about it, and the other one didn't, didn't tell them. So the thing happened, and we had that awful uh, well, tragedy. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's what happened, and uh, we won't tell you any more about that, but uh, it just goes on. Yeah, well, one of the things that they know also was that he had been sending threatening text messages to his mother-in-law. CBN's national security correspondent Eric Rosales has uncovered new details about the gunman and his long history of violence. Authorities have yet to release a specific motive on why Devin Kelly committed the deadliest mass shooting in Texas history, but police say it was neither racially nor religiously motivated. Just as CBN News previously reported, investigators say it was a domestic situation. He was on the hunt for his mother-in-law. Uh, I can tell you that the scene in there is horrific, is not even a word to describe it. After watching a video of the massacre inside this church, law enforcement officials say without a doubt the shooter intended to kill as many people as possible. There are many ways that, that he could have taken care of the mother-in-law without coming with 15 loaded magazines and an assault rifle to a church. I think he came here with a purpose and a mission. Police say after he got inside, the 26-year-old murdered his way to the front of the tiny church. Hundreds of empty shell casings were found. He killed 26 people, ranging in age from 18 months to 77 years old. 14 children in all, including the pastor and his wife's 14-year-old daughter, who attended the service while her parents were out of town. Stand up for Jesus. Once outside, police say Kelly was confronted by two men. I just wish I could have gotten there faster. I'm no hero. I, I am not. Stephen Williford, the man who officials say stepped in to stop Kelly, firing shots that hit him and then with another neighbor chased Kelly for miles, is now being credited for helping to put an end to the massacre. And every time I heard a shot, I knew that that probably represented a life. I was scared to death. An autopsy reveals Kelly was hit twice by Williford. A third wound was self-inflicted to the head. Police say as Kelly tried to get away, he used his cell phone and notified his father that he had been shot and didn't think he would make it. CBN News has uncovered the 26-year-old shooter was discharged from the Air Force in 2014 after serving a one-year sentence for assaulting his first wife and his 11-month-old stepson. Military records show that he hit the child in the head with enough force to produce death or bodily harm. In theory, the domestic abuse charges should have barred him from buying guns. Now the U.S. Air Force admitted it failed to pass along the information that would have prevented Kelly from obtaining the murder weapon. Eric Rosales, CBN News. You know, a church is what's called a soft target because a gunman can come in and fire with impunity. But I do believe that the people who stopped him were themselves armed. And it does seem in areas where the population is armed, these uh, random shooters don't show up because they're afraid of getting shot themselves. 
And it just may be that uh, we're going to have to but have arms in churches. But can you imagine anything as horrible as that? Somebody's got to go to church, and you've got to have designated shooters in the, in the congregation to protect you. Uh, it's a horrible concept. But um, anyhow, that's the way it is. So, uh, Wendy, what else do you have? Pat, as you mentioned, the small, close-knit town of Sutherland Springs, Texas, has been deeply shaken by this mass murder. But despite the horror, survivors are holding on to their faith in God in the midst of this dark time. Dale Hurd has the story. We've had a long night with our children and grandbabies we have left. For Pastor Frank Pomeroy and wife Sherry, it was hard to talk without crying. Their church shattered by senseless violence. Friends and family members gone. Their 14-year-old daughter Annabelle among the dead. As senseless as this tragedy was, our sweet Belle would not have been able to deal with losing so much family yesterday. Belle was surrounded yesterday by her church family that she loved fiercely. Other victims included Joanne Ward, who died as she used her body to shield her four young children. Two of her children died ages five and seven. Another is in critical condition. And eight members of the Holcomb family, three generations, including Associate Pastor Brian Holcomb, who was preaching Sunday, and his wife, Crystal, who was eight months pregnant, and three of their children. But despite this terrible tragedy, People in this small town are standing firm in their faith. And before the country and the national media, the church and its pastor are lifting up the name of Jesus, even as they know their friends and family are in heaven. We were a very close family. We ate together, we laughed together, we cried together, and we worshiped together. Now most of our church family is gone. Pastor, pastor Dimas Salaberrios has been ministering to the church and its pastor. This was a church that glorified Jesus. This was a church of prayer. This is a church that's uniting around their pastor as the great example right now of a true shepherd. Pastor Pomeroy was not in the church Sunday, but his sermon the week before the tragedy was that even if things happen you don't understand, you still need to do what God is calling you to do and to trust the Lord with all your heart, no matter what. We serve a God that's in a miracle working business, guys. He can heal, he can bring forth all kinds of incredible fruit. The thing is, trust him and not your own understanding. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. A GoFundMe webpage has been established to help the family of Associate Pastor Brian Holcomb. And you can find more on a link to that on our website, cbnnews.com. President Trump made it clear again today that the United States won't accept a nuclear North Korea. In South Korea, the president called on other countries to force the North to give up its nuclear weapons program. North Korea is a worldwide threat that requires worldwide action. We call on every responsible nation, including China and Russia, to demand that the North Korean regime end its nuclear weapons and its missile programs and live in peace. All nations must implement UN Security Council regulations and cease trade and business entirely with North Korea. The United States stands prepared to defend itself and its allies using the full range of our unmatched military capabilities, if need be. Despite his tough tone, the president also says he sees good progress toward a possible deal with North Korea on its nuclear weapons. Well, today is Election Day here in Virginia, and the race for governor appears very close. Polls show Democrat Ralph Northam with a slim lead over Republican Ed Gillespie. But in recent days, Gillespie appears to be closing the gap. You ready to win on November the 7th? Yeah. Are you ready to keep Virginia blue? Yeah. This is the most important election in our lifetime for governor. It really is. Political analysts often watch off-year elections to see if they will provide any clues to next year's congressional races. Well, today is also a special day for Billy Graham. It's the 
world famous evangelist 99th birthday. His son Franklin says as a family, we are just so very grateful that he's still with us. His mind is good, but he's quieter these days. He can't see or hear well, but his health is stable. Graham's career has spanned decades, starting with evangelistic crusades in the late 1940s and 1950s. His last crusade was in New York in 2005, and he preached the gospel around the world to more people in person than anyone else in history, Pat. And I had the privilege to be at that last crusade in New York, Pat, in, in 2005. And the one in New York was sometime before that when he came to New York. And uh, he's a dear friend of ours and uh, over the years, and uh, it's amazing he's held on. He thought uh, so often he was going, but he's, uh, a lot of his body isn't working anymore. I mean, he's having a hard time seeing, he's having a hard time hearing, uh, and his uh, kidneys aren't functioning, he has shunts in his brain and some other stuff. But uh, he's still holding on at 99. We congratulate him and we wish him a wonderful, happy birthday, and you can say many more returns. But, uh, you know, he's he's going strong, and it looks like he's going to hit 100. So I'm, Franklin I, said on the news he's entering his 100th year. So 100th year. Happy birthday. He's though. a wonderful, wonderful man, and he's been a, a, a towering figure. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were together over in Germany and, uh, you know, at the Berlin Wall, and uh, he came here, uh, gave a ma magnificent address, uh, on the opening of this headquarters building that we're in right now. So anyhow, he's a dear, dear friend and a friend of the family from before that. So uh, we'll miss him when he's gone, but uh, our congratulations and our best wishes go out to our dear friend. Well, coming up, it's the legal battle that will determine the limits of our religious freedoms. And it's all because one baker refused to make a cake for a gay wedding. He's just saying, that's something I don't agree with. I can't participate. Get a preview of this landmark case. That's next. Well, there's a baker who is a Christian. He lives in the West Coast. And uh, he said, I'm not going to bake a cake for a gay wedding. Well, there are many other bakers in the town where he lived, but the gays decided to make a test case, and so they sued that they were being discriminated against, and the city council agreed with them, fined the man a lot of money, and it was a cumulative uh, fine that would have put him out of business and bankrupted him. So he's now going to the Supreme Court, and we realize that the Constitution, the First Amendment, says very clearly, Congress, shall pass no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. There haven't been enough cases on free exercise. There have been a lot of cases on establishment. And you've heard so much the separation of church and state and all that stuff. But we haven't heard anything about the free exercise. And we Americans have cherished our freedom to worship God as we see fit, and people haven't forced us to do it. Now, the Supreme Court has taken up this Baker's case, and if you want a, a, a little uh, take in advance, I think the reason they took it up is because they want to reverse the uh, lower court activity and the fines uh, placed on that Baker and to declare freedom of religion an important right of the Americans. Well, anyhow, the headlines will focus on a baker and a wedding cake, and the case has serious implications for anyone whose faith goes against government rules. Our Heather Still has an excellent explanation. This case has the potential to significantly expand or restrict the way our country upholds religious liberty. It all started in a Colorado bakery when two gay men walked in and asked Jack Phillips to make them a wedding cake. Yeah, I really had no idea that it could escalate to something like this. I just wanted to try and find a polite way to tell them that I couldn't create the cake that they were looking for. Phillips' answer will now be dissected by nine Supreme Court justices, who will ultimately decide whether it was legally okay for him to say no. Phillips didn't say yes because he believes God designed marriage for men and women. 
His lawyer tells CBN News that tolerance is the best argument for her client. Regardless of what you believe about marriage, if you want to have freedom for yourself, you have to extend that freedom to others. Philip says his passion for art goes all the way back to childhood. If I wasn't playing, I was drawing. After high school, a new job helped him discover his life's work. I fell in love with working in the bakery. I like the pace. I like the work. I like the product. I like the people. I like everything about it. Phillips especially enjoyed meeting with couples about to get married, and his wedding business took off. That all came crashing down, however, after his conversation with Charlie Craig and David Mullins. They say he violated Colorado's anti-discrimination law when he refused to make their cake. The State Civil Rights Commission and an appeals court agreed. The rulings forced Phillips to stop making wedding cakes and cost him 40 percent of his business. So before this all happened, I had 10 employees working for me. Now I have four, including myself. I had full-time uh, people doing deliveries, full-time bakers. The ACLU and gay rights activists are using the discrimination ruling as the centerpiece of the couple's case. They argue public accommodation and non-discrimination laws benefit all. LGBT author and speaker John Corvino says people of faith are actually served by these laws. They offer as much protection to conservative religious customers as they do to LGBT customers, sometimes more. They mean that the gay atheist can't refuse to serve the conservative Christian any more than the conservative Christian can refuse to serve the same-sex couple. Phillips maintains he wanted to serve Mullins and Craig as customers and told them he would make them anything except a wedding cake. Attorney Mark Rienzi specializes in religious liberty cases for all faiths and says we live in a big enough country to accommodate people with different views on marriage. Giving Phillips the ability to continue to live out his faith um, is not going to uh, create some long list of bad effects for everybody else. It's really just living together in a world where people have different beliefs. And Phillips is not out there trying to stop somebody else from getting married. He's not trying to block somebody else's bakery so they can't bake the cake. He's just saying, that's something I don't agree with. I can't participate. Rienzi notes a long history of the U.S. supporting conscience rights. Doctors and nurses don't have to perform abortions, and pacifists don't have to fight in wars. Weddings are often religious ceremonies, and we don't have any tradition in this country of forcing people to celebrate somebody else's religious event. Wagner argues Phillips is the true victim of discrimination here. She points out how the same Civil Rights Commission allowed another Denver bakery to refuse to bake a cake with an anti-gay message. Let's viewpoint discrimination. Court watchers say no matter how you slice it, this case centers around Justice Anthony Kennedy. Known as the Supreme Court's top swing vote, he supported gay rights, religious liberty, and free speech. Phillips says he's learned a lot about trusting God in the last five years, and will trust him now for this one. I'm an artist, and I'm a Christian at the same time. And there's, I hope that the court realizes that everybody has those lines that, that we draw. If the court rules in favor of Phillips, it will no doubt move our country towards a more robust understanding of religious freedom. And Phillips supporters say that is good news, not just for Christians who think like Phillips, but for people of all faiths. Reporting in Washington, Heather Sell, CBN News. The state should not be allowed to coerce somebody to do something against their religious beliefs. That's the nexus of this case. It is coercive, and the gays want to coerce you to accept their point of view. And if you don't want to do it, they want to fine you or put you in jail or push you out of business. That's the case in a nutshell. That's what it is. And it is my feeling the Supreme Court is going to rule in favor of the baker because it's time that they have a clear, uh, ringing declaration in, def in defense of religious liberty. And that's what it is. Congress shall pass no law respecting an establishment of religion. We've got that thing down pat. Or uh, prohibiting the free exercise. This is the free exercise case. And I think with the Roberts Co Court, uh, regardless of what Anthony Kennedy does, uh, that, ca that, that court's going to come down on the side of the baker. Uh, unless I totally miss my, my guess, and I, I, 
you know, I'm guessing, because who knows what the, the Supremes will do. But they've got a new man on um, who is a, a strong constitutionalist. And, well, we'll see. But I, I, I think it, that that's the reason they took it. They have to grant cert for some reason. And I think they must have felt that this case deserves their attention. And uh, there must be a number of them uh, that say we're going to side with the baker. Terry? Well, up next, a man who would down a case of beer and pop 75 Vicodins just about every day. I became full-fledged alcoholic. I mean, I, I didn't do anything without alcohol. I didn't go to the bathroom. I didn't, I didn't shower without it. Hear how he conquered his addictions once and for all, and that's next. Hey, you're watching the 700 Club, and we're glad you're with us today. A very momentous day for those who live in Virginia and New Jersey. The selection of governor may have be a bellwether in terms of what may be happening in the nation in the future. We're not sure, but it's important in those states to vote. Well, Neil Morris was a pill-popping booze hound who got banned from every bar in his city. He spent time in rehab. He spent time in the psych ward. He spent time in the hospital ICU after he failed to commit suicide. Neil said he was, quote, a terrorist who held his family hostage. But even worse than that, he said he was just as bad as his father. I didn't want to be hit. I didn't want to be yelled at. I wanted a lot from a father. That's what I, I always wanted. Neil Morris grew up with an abusive father who abandoned him and his family when he was 13. I just felt, you know, if my own dad didn't love me, then, you know, something was wrong with me. That left Neil vulnerable to an older neighbor's offer of friendship and eventually his sexual advances. He was the first male figure in my life to actually show me that, you know, that he cared about me, that he accepted me. They only met on occasion over the years, but Neil could never shake the feelings of shame that followed. Just dirty and disgusting, like something's truly, really wrong with me. By high school, he was dating. At the same time, he was also drinking and using drugs almost every day. There were putting a Band-Aid on something that hurt. They would numb the pain. Then after high school, his girlfriend became pregnant. They decided to keep the baby and got engaged. But Neil's mom convinced the girl they were too young to start a family, and she had an abortion. My interpretation of we were too young and we weren't ready was, I'm not a good enough person and I'm not gonna be the father that this child needs. Then he found out his fiance was cheating on him. I was really broken. I started isolating. I stopped hanging around with people. I also told that other man that was in my life, no, no more. And so I really felt I had nobody to turn to, nobody to talk to. Everybody was unreliable in my life. I became full-fledged alcoholic. I mean, I, I didn't do anything without alcohol. I didn't go to the bathroom. I didn't, I didn't shower without it. Over the next nine years, Neil abused alcohol and prescription medication. He got three DUIs and was banned from every bar in his hometown. I was eating about 75 Vicodins a day on top of, you know, anywhere from a 12 pack to a case of beer. During this time, Neil moved in with a woman and her two sons. Later, she became his common law wife, and together they had a daughter. I thought I was a good dad. I was in denial of really the truth of what was going on. The truth was, Neil was physically abusing his stepsons and his nephew, who visited on occasion. I couldn't stop getting angry and getting physical. I couldn't stop drinking. I, I could not change. And so I really felt like I was the terrorist and I was holding my family hostage. And so I tried to commit suicide. After three days in the ICU, 
I was wheeled into the psych ward and that's kind of when reality really set in. I really had a problem. A week later, Neil was released from the psych ward and started going to AA meetings. He stopped drinking and at the suggestion of his sponsor, began listening to sermons on Christian radio. The roadblock I had with God was Father. And to me, the word Father just didn't sit well with me. It was a negative word in my life. I just believed if God really was real, then why would he allow things to happen to happen? Especially to kids, why, why would that happen? Neil had been nine months sober when he relapsed one night. While drunk, he told his wife something she needed to know. He had been cheating on her. She started hitting him until finally he hit her back. That was really when I felt not only had I become my dad, I had exceeded the level of love that my dad, I never saw my dad hit a woman. And so that was an all time low for me. That night would mark the end of their marriage. The next morning, Neil knew what he had to do. That's when I realized that I needed to put down my guard. And I got on the phone and I called that radio station and uh, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Neil started going to church to grow in his faith and never touched alcohol or drugs again. He also went through a rehab program called Celebrate Recovery, which helped him overcome his deep feelings of shame. My heavenly father has forgiven me some of the horrible, rotten things that I have done to people. My stepsons, my nephew, they have forgiven me. And how could I not forgive my father, my earthly father? Today, Neil has been sober for over six years and helps run Celebrate Recovery at his church. He also takes care of his daughter, Lindsay, and is getting ready to marry his fiance, Maria. I really looked at God as a father, as Jesus said, and he cried out to him, Abba, Father, Daddy. You know, that was the one thing that I felt that I never had in life that I have today, is I have, I have a dad. Jesus said it very clearly, when you stand praying, if you have aught against any, Forgive that your heavenly Father might forgive you. That is the absolute key to miracles. If you do not have forgiveness in your heart, you will not see happiness, you will not see joy, and you will not see forgiveness, and you certainly won't see miracles. But when you have a forgiving heart, all of a sudden the miracles of God begin to tumble down upon you one after the other. In Neil's case, he couldn't forgive his father. Why should he? His father was terrible. He couldn't forgive the neighbor who had taken advantage of him when he was a young boy. Uh, he couldn't forgive these people. But suddenly he found forgiveness, and he came to the Lord, and he sought God's forgiveness. And when he had that forgiveness, he forgave others. When you stand praying, if you have aught against any, forgive that your heavenly Father might forgive you. If you want to have miracles, you need to be in a state of being born again. You have a state of being forgiven. And I ask you right now, who do you hate? Who have you got a grievance against? Who has done you wrong? Now, you don't have to be sexually molested. You can just have a slight. Somebody slighted you. A teacher didn't give you the grades you thought you deserved. A girl wasn't attracted to you and she laughed at you, and you've held a grudge ever since. All those things have come down and you, you say, I just can't forgive. Well, I'm asking you at this moment, if you want to have miracles, I want you to forgive in your heart. You, it may take a list of people, and I, I haven't got time for the list, but right now, <laughs> I want you to tell the Lord, I'm forgiving. I am forgiving. So bow your head wherever you are right now. And pray these words. Lord Jesus, that's right, pray with me. Lord, you know what's been done to me. 
and you know what I've done to others. So right now, Lord, I ask you to forgive me for what I've done, how I've broken your laws, how I've hurt other people, how I've sinned against you. And then, Lord, at this moment, for those who have hurt me, I forgive them. In the name of Jesus, I forgive them. And from this moment on, I will walk in forgiveness. I thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and healing me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed with me just then, I want to give you something. It's called a new day. It's a little packet, and it tells you what it means to be born again. It tells you what it means to have an exchanged life. There's a little CD in here. It's got, it's got about 73 minutes of very concentrated teaching. You can pop it into your CD player, wherever you've got one, in your car or whatever, and you can listen to it. It's, it's very simple and very, very direct, but it'll tell you what's happening. And I want to give this to you if you just give me a call. It's 1-800-700-7000. 1-800-700-7000. It's easy to remember. You call and say, look, I just prayed with Pat. And yes, I have forgiven. I've forgiven that parent. I've forgiven that teacher. I have forgiven that boyfriend or girlfriend. I've forgiven that sibling. I've forgiven whoever. I'm not going to hold grudges anymore because the Lord's forgiving me. Terry? Well, still ahead, time for another round of Your Questions, Honest Answers. Lori says, my estranged father needs a guardian, but I am already my mother's guardian and I can't handle both. Am I sinning if I allow my father to become a ward of the state? Pat's going to respond to that and more. Plus, the 700 Club host with the Scottish Brogue. We're going to sit down with Sheila Walsh later on today's 700 Club. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Sonia Carson, the mother of Dr. Ben Carson, has died. Carson often quoted stories about his mother's work ethic while running for president. He wrote this tribute to her on Facebook. Although she came from an impoverished background with little formal education, she somehow understood how success was achieved in our society. She absolutely refused to be a victim. He also credits his mother's example for his own faith in God. The cleanup is underway after a massive storm system hit the upper Midwest. It contained at least nine tornadoes. It tore the roofs off factories and destroyed homes across Indiana, Ohio, and into Pennsylvania. The storms were so strong, some people in Indiana felt thankful just to be alive. Well, we lost everything, but I have everything. I have my family, my family. We're very blessed. We're very blessed. Amen. Scuba divers found the bodies of two men in a flooded basement in Erie, Pennsylvania. They went there for shelter during a tornado warning. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. We'll be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. Welcome back. It's time for your questions and some honest answers. And Pat, this first one comes from Lori, who says, my estranged father needs a guardian. I am my mom's guardian already, and I don't think I can handle being both my parents' guardian. My mom has dementia and is wheelchair bound. I work full time and am blessed to have my sister's help taking care of our mom and keeping her home with us until the day she goes to meet Jesus. She would never survive in a nursing home but my father has already been placed in one in another state and seems to be adjusting well, so we are told. I don't think anyone else in the family can step up to become his guardian. Is it a sin to allow him to stay where he is and essentially become a ward of the state? The Bible tells us to take care of our parents in their old age so they want for nothing. Am I sinning if I don't become my father's guardian? I don't think so. I don't think that... Uh, it, uh, the Bible requires a child to become essentially a slave of an of a parent with dementia, the, the Bible says honor, and the, the word in Greek is tomeo, give weight to your decisions of your parents. You honor their mother and father. And Jesus said that you can't 
take what was due them and, and say it's Corbin or it's given to God, and therefore you don't do anything for them. But uh, if, if you provide for them uh, a, ch a parent with dementia, uh, you have a, a good caregiver. You don't, they're not a, quote, ward of the state. You're, you're helping them, and, and so I don't feel guilty about it, all right? Yeah, this is a viewer who says, I have a film degree with aspirations of becoming a Christian filmmaker, but I live where I have little to no options of working for a production company. I've thought about moving, but circumstances are keeping me from doing that. My dad has a year and a half left of his prison sentence. My mom needs help paying rent. I'm applying for minimum wage jobs, but no one will hire me. What should I do? Oh, uh, you asked me, I don't know enough about you to tell you what you should do, but... Uh... I, th I think there are plenty of positions uh, for somebody who's willing to work. There are all kinds of jobs where people are willing to work. Uh, they may be, uh, you know, entry level. They're, they may be something else. But you can also, there's, there are telemarketing opportunities. There, there, there are any number of positions that are a vacant right now looking for people to work. So I think, you know, get out of your little bubble you're in and get on with that. But you want to be a filmmaker and you can't leave home because of your mother. Well, that, that's nice. You look after your mother, but the, the time will come. Your father gets out of prison another year or so and, and then go out to California or wherever they do movies and see what you can do. All right. This is Jerry who says, does donating to charities qualify as tithing or is it different? I sell things on eBay and donate 100% of the proceeds to various charities, but I don't have a lot of disposable income for cash donations to a church. What do you think? Um, I think that uh, there are organized uh, groups that do wonderful work. Salvation Army does wonderful work. The people they feed uh, and clothe the poor and the hungry. Uh, there, there are any number of missionary organizations that do wonderful things. And I, I think that's part of the overall church of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think if you give to them, it's like a tithe. All right? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a viewer, Pat, who says, um, let me just look here, make sure I've got the, the right one coming up. No, okay. All right. Who says, I had an emotional breakdown following some really difficult life issues. During that time, a man at church was mentoring me. Both of us were married. Someone started a rumor that this gentleman and I were having a love affair, which was false. The rumor spread like wildfire, as was to be expected. I ended up leaving the church out of shame. I wanted to clear my name, but I was so ashamed and already emotionally a mess. It's been three years since this happened. My husband talked to the pastor and asked permission for us to come back. We were told to return. We've been back for seven weeks. The problem is no one will speak to me and they won't even welcome my kids to Bible class. I didn't have an Affair with this man, but the church treats me as if I did. My question, will God forgive me even though the church cannot? Well, what is it to forgive? You haven't done anything wrong. Of course God forgives you. The church is a bunch of stinking Pharisees that, that you're, you're describing. <laughs> and why should you worry about that church? There are many, many, many churches uh, in your community and in other communities who seek a one that is more accepting and more forgiving, all right? <laughs> How do you really feel about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd ask, okay. This is Charles who says, my son is in the third grade, recently got in trouble at school for bad behavior. When I asked him what the bad behavior was about, I was shocked to find out that he had called another classmate a racial slur. I couldn't believe my son did this. And it turns out it was from a TV show we were watching as a family, which mentioned the word in historical context. Should we restrict his TV access to all of these shows altogether, or should we watch them with him so that we can put it into context for him so he knows what's right and what's wrong? You, you said the right thing. Watch with him and explain what's going on. But you, you have, you know, the, the, the N-word. Uh, there are black people that use that word on television in television shows and in movies. And uh, you explain to your son what this is in the context, and that uh, this is a racial slur that makes people upset. But there are a lot of things that people say about others that make them upset. And the fact that you watch TV with your son and explain to him that the, the dialogue that these people are, that they're actors, this isn't real life, and that this is fictional, 
and uh, what they're saying in this uh, is not appropriate. Now, you, you know, that's the way to go. All right. Teach. Teach, teach, right? <laughs> teach, 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 teach. Be a parent. All right. Thank you. Well, up next, Sheila Walsh gets candid about some of the messes she went through in life and reveals how she got through them. We need to know what we can do right now to find the strength we need to get through those messes to the other side. She'll share more right after this. A few years ago, Sheila Walsh was at a conference hosted by Kay and Rick Warren. The topic was about mental health, and Sheila was one of the featured speakers. There, she said to the audience, I am profoundly grateful for the gift of mental illness. It means I can look into the eyes of someone else suffering, and I can say, me too. Here's her story. Best-selling author, co-host of Life Today, and former co-host of The 700 Club, Sheila Walsh is back to bring encouragement to those dealing with despair. We need to know what we can do right now, right where we are, to find the strength we need to get through those messes to the other side. In her most candid book to date, called In the Middle of the Mess, Sheila shares her darkest memories and how God was her safe place when life was terrifying. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Sheila Walsh. It's so great to have you here. Thanks, Terry. It's lovely like to see you. Like old homework week. I, know. I mean, it, I just never feel like as much time has gone by as has, but mm -hmm. you don't come often enough. <laughs> oh, thank you. I love it. I love seeing all the people who've been here and faithfully for years. <laughs> they love seeing you. I want to talk. Your book is called In the Middle of the Mess, Strength for This Beautiful Broken Life. And I mean, that's just kind of a statement right there, isn't it, for what it's all about. But you talk so candidly in this book, and you always have in all of the messages that you bring about the things that have been messes in your life, the things that have been broken. And I think a lot of people try to hide those things. Why is it and how is it that you're so free about opening up about who you really are? Well, honestly, Terry, I think it's because Christ is about redeeming those broken places. And also, when it says in Galatians that we would comfort others mm -hmm. with the same comfort with which we've been comforted, because not every mess is huge. Yeah. I mean, over the last, <clears throat> excuse me, 20, 25 years, people have said to me, what do I do when I'm right in the middle of this mess? And sometimes it's a divorce. Sometimes it's not knowing how to raise your kid. It can be anything. Yeah. But my thing was, how can I help people find strength right in the middle? Mm -hmm. Not when it's over, you know, but right when they're in the middle of something. I want to quote something you said in your book. You wrote, I've done everything I knew to get closer to God. I read my Bible. I fasted and prayed for 21 days. The result wasn't a great spiritual breakthrough. Instead, I became a patient in a psychiatric ward. Were you doing something wrong? I mean, I think that happens to a lot of people. It's like God answered her prayer, but why not mine? I think I didn't understand mental illness. I didn't understand that it was something that is a clinical diagnosis. It's not just a bad day. Because yeah. I thought, well, I'm a Christian. I should be able to pull myself together. Um, but actually, I look on it as one of God's greatest gifts to me. Yeah. When you think that you have to live your life pleasing God and doing everything right, and you end up in a psych hospital, and there, discover how loved you are based on the finished work of Christ, mm -hmm. not on what you bring to the table. I've discovered that your history in Christ does not dictate your destiny. Yeah. And yet so many times, and mental health would be one of those areas to me where you feel like you just get a leg up and you just get in the saddle and then through no fault of your own, this thing hits again. Well, life happens for one thing, but even as you said, it's a condition. So how do you deal with the, the repetition of the drag of all of that on your life? You know, I almost stopped writing this book, Terry. About a third of the way through, I got a phone call in the middle of the night from my sister to say that my mom had died. Yeah. And she's always been, my dad committed suicide when I was five, so she's always been this rock in my life. And I found myself spiraling again yeah. and asking God, what's wrong? And I really felt the Lord say, it's time to bring that final piece of the puzzle of who you are to me. I've never talked about the fact that I've struggled with suicidal thoughts most of my life. Mm. And I thought I was the only one. And then I was invited to speak at a conference in the Midwest. And I shared a little bit of that and said, if you're like me, if you're a cutter, if you've contemplated suicide, if you've ever attempted it, would you join me at the front? Over 400 women, wow. ages from 15 to 72. And I thought, it is time to shine the brightest light into the darkest corners of the church. 
So where do we find help in those moments? Because, you know, you're talking about the dark corners of the church. There are reasons why people don't share publicly in church. I mean, you know, they're fearful. I mean, you, you heard the story earlier in our Q&A time of a woman. She hadn't even done what she was being yeah. accused of. In the what do we as the church have to do and how do people who are suffering learn to trust again? That's a huge question. I love what Pat said, stinking Pharisees. <laughs> <laughs> love that. But, you know, there's just, I, I think we need to learn that, that, that we're not the good news, that Christ is. Yeah. You know, I don't think anybody in this broken world is going to come rushing to our church doors if we don't learn to be honest and real and transparent. And I mean, I no longer pursue perfection. I pursue Christ, who is perfect. Yeah. And my thing to be, in this book, I try to make it really practical. I talk about meditation, about gratitude, about solitude, about just the things that I have in my life that are platforms that I can stand on when everything else feels like it's slipping away. And you need to have one or two people in your life that you can share everything with. I call them safe sisters. We all need somebody yeah. like that in our life. Absolutely. You also shared the story of a time when you were in the airport with your son when he was younger uh -huh. and you had a moment. Share that. <laughs> It was, it was just so significant to me because Christian was little and we were getting back late into Miami airport midnight and he whispered into my ear, mom, I've wet myself, would you cover me? And there was something about that intimate moment and I felt as if God said, Sheila, would you let me cover you? Don't wait, don't tidy yourself up and come to me. Come as you are and let me cover you. Yeah. You use the imagery of a lion throughout your book. Share a little bit about the why of that and what it means to you. A friend of mine um, gave me a picture one day. She said, I was praying for you and God showed me this picture and she'd printed it off the internet and it was a lion and a girl in the back um, with a sword out, but she was blindfolded. And I'm like, I don't quite get that bit. <laughs> that like, explanation. Yeah. And she said, because the lion is, is Christ, the lion of Judah, and that's you. And you don't need to see where you're going because yeah. he knows where he's going. When my mom died, the one thing I wanted from her stuff was a little picture over her bed that just said two words, yes, Lord. And that's how my mom lived her life. Yeah. And I thought, when we can have a yes, Lord, into every day, trusting that he knows where he's taking us, that brings security and peace. You know, Sheila, I think so many times when we hear people share of woundedness in their life, it's something that happened early on. And often we drag that anchor through life with us. Do you ever get to the other side of the pain of some of those things that you've shared so candidly? I mean, honestly, Terry, I think part of that will always be part of my journey. Mm -hmm. I still take medication. I still have dark days, but, um, but it's different now. It's not something that's a secret because I think sometimes we think our secrets keep us safe, but they just keep us lonely yeah. and isolated. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I know what to do. I have an incredible husband. My darling son is now 21, junior wow, at Texas a and I know I have <laughs> no idea. Um, he's just amazing. And I, I, do, I talk to my friends, but the greatest thing is if somebody's listening and think, well, I don't have friends like that, my thing to them would be start with the Lord. Yeah. Be brave enough to tell God the whole truth. There's something about that that's so liberating because he's seen our movie, he's read our book, he knows everything and he loves us. There is something about verbalizing it. There's just no yeah. question about it. I want to mention again your book, In the Middle of the Mess. We have only scratched the surface of Sheila's story. You can learn more in her book. It's The subtitle is Strength for This Beautiful, Broken Life, something we all experience. It's available in stores nationwide. It's a great read. Thank you for being with us. Love Always seeing you again. Always a treat. But well, we want to leave you with these words. They're from Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Thank you for being with us today. Hope that God's spoken something wonderful into your life as you've heard the stories of others who are sharing their pain and their redemption. It's all about Jesus, and He's there for you. If you want to talk to somebody, call our toll-free line. It's 1-800-700-7000. See you tomorrow.